And for this, our continuation of our Motown, the Early Years series. Tonight, we're very pleased to uh, be focusing on the library. And I'd like to thank uh, Lee College, who is videotaping the series, and the Baytown Sun for their coverage, and KBuck for their, their taping of the program. Well, we have an exciting panel tonight. And uh, I bet I'm not the only person who claims that Eva Ray Collier is the first person they met upon moving to Baytown. Well, certainly I'm not if everybody is like me, and the first thing you do upon getting settled is go look for the library. And I found Eva Ray in a small red brick, brick building adjacent to Citizens Bank. And she, here she is to tell us all about it. when I finished high school, the Great Depression was still on and jobs was really hard to find. There wasn't funds for college, so I was really getting discouraged when a year went by and I still had not found a job. So several of my girlfriends in town, meaning Goose Creek, mentioned that they were going to apply for work through one of the government programs. So one of President Franklin Roosevelt's programs was the NYA to help unemployed young people. So I have to admit my faith was kind of small and I went to see if I would stand a chance. But believe it or not, was I greatly surprised several days later when I went back to check when he said that they did have an opening for a part-time help at the Goose Creek branch of the Harris County Library. So I was really a nervous little girl when I walked up the sidewalk that morning to report to Mrs. Ann McCullough, who was librarian at that time, assisted by Elizabeth Zerline. So for the next several years, I really went through a good training program under their supervision. During the early years of the war, Elizabeth did get a job with Humble at that time and went to work leaving a vacancy, which I was fortunate to get hired. So I went on as a foot of full-time employee of Harris County. So little did I know when I started my tenure there that 45 plus years I'd still be <laughs> <laughs> trying to help furnish services through the public library in this area. The uh, Ms. Lucy Fuller Gross was the first Harris County librarian and Goose Creek was the first branch, which she brought books down here in 1921, which was shifted to four or five different locations before 1925, when she approached Mr. Ross S. Sterling to see if there might be funds that he would pay rent for a permanent location for the Goose Creek branch. So he asked them how about a new library or a library building for Goose Tree. So right away they got busy and on August the 14th, 1925, 
the little library up on the corner of West Texas and Jones was officially open. So, of course, it was 12 years later that I joined the staff or started my training period. Two employees was all that they could ever afford or that was included in the budget all the time that I was there until the mid uh, late 50s. They did furnish us with a one page that worked after school and on Saturday mornings, which was greatly appreciated because up until that time, if one of us was ill or had a vacation for a few days, the other one had all the load to carry, which, believe it or not, at that time was good bit, even if the circulation wasn't too great. Uh, taking advantage of the services of the library was hampered by transportation of a lot of people to get to the library. At that time, most people had one car. So unless the children lived close enough to walk or ride bicycles, they had to wait until the father or husband was home to bring them to the library, which was usually after school hours or on Saturday mornings. After the Brunson was built and all the kiddos would come to the kiddie show on Saturday mornings, well then they'd head right from the show to the library. So, as you well know, we never got to close at one o'clock. <laughs> so, a lot of people remember when they refer to the old library and they say, oh, do you remember the little library downtown? or the little red building by the bank, or the little building that smelled musty. Well, all of these were true because it was small, it was brick, and it was red. And at the time I started, it was partly covered with English ivy, which really gave it a distinguished look in my books. When I first went to work, the next door was a used car lot. I don't know if any of you here remember that, but we were really happy when the Citizens Bank decided that they would build their new building next door to us, and we really felt uptown when we had the Citizens Bank as our next door neighbors. They, in turn, helped to keep the lawn trimmed and mowed, which gave us a nicer look. We had one custodian that came two evenings a week after his job in between time where we did what needed to be done with the help of Deacon Jones, which I don't know how we would have survived without his help, because nothing was too small or large if we needed help. First time I remember seeing him and was the uh, first Christmas I was there. We had the Tree of Lights, which the Lions Club sponsored, and he came and wired the tree and got it ready for the Boy Scout troop to turn the switch on, which gave us our first Tree of Light that I remember in Goose Creek. Some of you are wondering how small the building was. We have some pictures on the easel over here. It was 825 square feet, which was divided into three rooms. The large room at, at the front of the building, which uh, the outside wall was lined with our bookshelves, with our circulation desk. Two tables with chairs uh, around it for reading, and one corner next to the circulation desk was our children's area. So you can imagine about how many volumes we had at that time. The other back room, the back room that had the outside entrance on Jones Street, was used for the uh, 
chef list file for the shelves for magazines. On uh, Wednesday mornings, once a month, it was used for the book review club. And on Sunday mornings, a uh, class from the Grace Methodist Church met there. And we never knew which one it was that left a note one time we came to work. We got a note on the desk and said, a snake has been spotted in <laughs> the library. So you can imagine for several weeks, every time we moved the book or sat down at the desk, well, we took precaution to look to see that the snake wasn't ready to pounce on us. And talk about things being rationed during the war, which included a lot of things. We had to take turns to come early enough to get in line over in West Republic to buy ice so we could have a thermos of cool water to drink during the day. We did have a summer reading program for the children. We gave certificates uh, at the end of the summer for the number of books that they had read. Of course, we didn't have McDonald's or Bonus Burger or those places to reward them for each 12 that they read, but we did have certificates that we gave to them. We did have story hours that uh, volunteer teachers or would take turns doing for us. In the winter, they would meet in the reading room at the back for the book review club met. And in the summer, they would meet out on the back lawn under the shade tree. The other little room was our work room where we had a table and a typewriter, shelves for our back issues of magazines, which we didn't have space to keep for two or three years of the current magazines. So without the help or the service we got from the Texas Extension Service, I don't know how we would have made it or how a lot of the students would have ever written their term themes or papers that they had to do. So every day in the mail we'd get packets of material from them. And I often wondered some of the titles that we sent to them if we would be fortunate or if they would surely have anything on that subject. But believe it or not, we never requested one thing that they didn't send something to us. So a lot of students have that service to um, responsible for some of the grades that they made in school. And I guess they did pretty good because I can remember some of our students that came during those years, was Alan Irvin, Wanda Jones Arden, Molly Bowers Sinclair, Rosemary Kent, and just Maddie Howard, Faye <laughs> <laughs> Vanderbilt's children, and a lot of the ones that were children at that time are now patrons of our library including their children and grandchildren. And that really makes me feel good or proud that you do set a pattern for your children to follow. There's so many memories I'd like to share, but, but if more memories for me, so many of y'all wouldn't be associated with. But, um, on um, uh, Wednesday night, October 31st of 62, after the headquarters had been set up to get ready for our new Sterling Municipal Library, which I had decided to come with rather than commute to Houston if they close the Goose Creek Ranch Library. I left my key laying on the desk and the next morning at 8 o'clock on November the 1st, 1963, I came to work for Sterling Municipal Library, which will soon be 24 years ago. And I 
and I can't think of anything that's been more rewarding than the years that I have spent in library service. where she has had a very distinguished career. We're happy that Maddie made the trip from New Braunfels so she could be with us tonight. It's good to be home. <laughs> so many faces mean so much in my life. And I swore about you would cry. <laughs> called me from the sun a couple of days ago to ask me what I was going to talk about. I said, well, I, as I understand it, it's reminiscing about early days in Goose Creek and uh, the development of libraries here. And uh, she innocently said, well, now, Mrs. Howard, you live in New Brownfields? And I said, yes. But they're asking you to come over here and talk about libraries and Baytown. And I said, yes. <laughs> and she was kind of puzzled and she hesitated. And I said, well, I guess they did it because I'm the only one old enough to remember the very beginnings of Goose Creek. <laughs> and I guess that's why I'm included. Um, I tried to remember a lot of things about those early days. But my rememberer doesn't work the way it used to. I had to struggle these last few days to try to remember the things pertaining to the library and about Goose Creek. And one of the first pictures that always comes to my mind is a little girl about six, seven years old maybe, standing with my grandfather, Dr. Dudley, holding onto his hand and trying to hide behind his leg because there was a great, big, huge, noisy machine out there stirring up the biggest dust storm I have ever seen in my life. And we were standing on Asheville between Texas Avenue and Defeat. Midway. And my grandfather told me that that was a grader. And all I could think of was school grades. He said, no, they're grading up a road that's going to be the main town, the main street of our new town. And it became new town. And that was Texas Avenue. Long, long time ago. I'm not sure, but I think that was about 19 and 20. We came here from North Texas in 1919. And my grandfather, Dr. Dudley, who, by the way, was the first doctor to come to this area when the oil boom started, bought a lot, a, a block of land in that new town. And it was bordered by Texas Avenue, Asheville Smith, Asheville Street, Asheville, Asheville Smith, Diffie and Gillette Gilliard, that whole block. And he built his house on the corner of Diffie and Asheville. And that house stood there until about 10 years ago. And it was moved out somewhere. Somebody bought it after, after all those years. And his little office he built on Asheville, midway in that block. Before that, he had lived in Pelly, and his office was in a little building, a one-story building across the street from what became the city hall down there, that two-story building. And across the side street was Wiesenthal's drugstore. And Grandma and Grandpa lived in a, I guess you'd call it a tent. Uh, the, one of those things that they used during the war, it had a floor up out so high and a square-topped tent over it. 
sides built up a little piece. They lived in one of those when they first came here in 1919. And when they started building new towns, Grandpa went up there and bought that block of land and built his house. And my brother Jim was sitting back there and I were talking this morning about remembering when that was that whole block was an empty block. And Grandpa put up a sign board, a great big sign. It was a little big to me, a little girl. Probably was about so big about the lots that he had for sale there. And that sign stood about where your store was now. And that was one of the times that I first decided what I was going to do with my life. They, we had had a circus come into town. Came in on the train from Crosby. You know when you had, they had to turn around, had a roundhouse, the train had to go back to Crosby. Date was at date Crosby, I believe. The circus came in on the train, and that big tent was put up, that big pasture out there, about where Lovett and Commerce cross, along in that area. That was just one big thing. And I had seen trapeze performers for the first time in my life. And I decided I was going to be a trapeze performer. And Jim and I used to play on that, on that sign, and I learned to walk on that little thing on the top of it and do my balancing. And that's when I decided I was going to join the circus. I also decided later to be a nurse. Because my brother Bob, older than I, decided he was going to be a doctor and use Grandpa's old tools. <laughs> and I was going to be his nurse. <laughs> but that was before I discovered the world of books. That Texas Avenue began to fill up. Began, people began to build buildings along there. Grandpa sold the whole width of the block from Texas Avenue to Defee on the far end. And Mr. Stiles, Andy Stiles, built his home on the corner of Defee and Gaylord. <coughs> Those of you who remember Mr. Stiles and Mrs. Stiles, oh, they were elegant people. I used to watch them take a stroll every afternoon about twilight on the first sidewalks that were laid in New Street. <coughs> and Mr. Stiles built a, bit, a brick building, and I, I don't know whether that was the first brick building or not, but I, it was one of the very first on the front end of that lot, that block. Um, I don't remember what was in it. Jim thinks that it was a sort of a storehouse where they rented cars, jitneys. We talked about that today, and um, somebody else thought that it was where they rented jitneys. I remember the Lambright brothers, A.C. and Ralph and Luke, had a garage and a filling station in there. And Grandpa put up a little filling station down on the corner of Texas Avenue in Asheville. And that was one of the very first humble filling stations. I have a picture of my uncle standing in front of it, the big sign up there, Dudley Filling Station, gasoline 16 cents a gallon. And then that block on down toward the railroad, down toward Commerce began to fill up. A brick building on the corner was Harvey's Hardware. Har Harvey's Hardware, is that right, Mary? Yeah. Harvey's Hardware. And then Mr. Herring's drugstore, and across the street was Woods' drugstore, about the same time. This was all about 21 or 22. And Joyner's Food Market was right next to Mr. Uh, Herring's store. And that's where Al Mellinger's style shop was later. I guess it built up down that way because the railroad brought people in and took them out. <laughs> and that was the only transportation we had until about 25 when they put in an interurban between Houston and down through Highland into, into Baytown. And that was a joy. I went to town, went to Houston several times by going down to Bush's Landing and taking a water jitney or to La Porte and taking a train into Houston. And my brother Bob had to have an emergency appendectomy. And they took him on a water jitney across to La Forte, put him on a train, and took him to the hospital in Houston. Oh, 
talk so long ago, but I know some of you young people may think what's that old woman talking about. <laughs> I thought she was going to talk about libraries. Well, I am, but I, I felt like you needed to have a mental picture of, in your mind's eye, of what we live, what, what it was for us before libraries. We, uh, we had no books in our home. Yes, we did. We had a little book about this size, about that big, of Emerson's essays that I studied when I was in high school with my father. But, and he had several Shakespearean plays. And Mama had a book called Motherhood. A great big book. Thick. And it had stories and it had a lot of poetry in it and some songs that Mama used to sing to us. We had no music in our house, no TVs, no radios, no VCRs. I saw my first one working last night, believe it or not. <laughs> um, um, I remember my first radio, very first radio. My eldest brother finished grammar school here in 1924. And we had no high school, and he had to go to Houston to go to high school. Lived with my uncle in there. And during that year, he brought home the first radio that I ever saw. It's a little box about that big a square called a crystal box. It had earphones, and there was a little needle that you ran around on the top of this box until you located a sound. <laughs> and you heard some music from the station in Houston. And after a while, you'd lose it, and you'd have to run it all over that big crystal <laughs> set again and find it. I don't know why, but I remember doing that. And we always sat in a west window of the house because the sounds had come in better that way. That was my first radio. My first circus. My first airplane. We saw out there about where the circus was. But we lived a good life. We had a happy childhood out there on that farm even if we did nearly starve to death at the time. We had no money, but we had a good time. It was a good life back in those days without all of these things that people have today. We had a mother who sang to us and told us stories and Papa read to us. I can remember Papa reading Shakespeare to us. Well, Grandpa moved his office from Pelly up to Newtown. And about that time, they built a big, I mean a big, two-story brick building over on the corner of Texas and Asheville. And I remember how beautiful it was. They had a tile floor. Does it still have a tile floor? I don't know. I haven't been in it in a long, long time. Uh, and the ceiling, it seemed to me like it was 50 feet high. I thought this room was bigger than it is, too. When I walked in, well, I go, I was surprised. So it was probably 18 or 20 feet ceilings. But it was high enough that the second floor of that building had a long stairway in the back of the building. They may have an elevator there now, I don't know. But that was a long stairway right up to the very top of the world, it looked like. And it was upstairs in that building that I found my purpose in life. And that was the first branch, Eva Ray, our branch library. And I didn't know what branch meant. I thought it was a Mr. Branch who had put it in the library. <laughs> it was our, the first one I had ever been in. But there were marvelous books and then to be read. And oh, how we did read them. <laughs> and then it moved to a couple of other places. And they put in a small one down in Kelly. I never was in that one until about the time it closed. But uh, a lot of my friends used that one down there, too. I had library card number eight. And I still have it. I looked for it. I could, I've moved so many times, things are packed away, and I didn't find it. But I have library card number eight. And I used it all through the 20s, and all through the 30s, and all through the 40s, and through the 50s until we got this. And aren't we proud of it? Huh. And I'm so happy to say that I was partly instrumental in bringing Flora here. 
Laura came, I was out at the college library by that time, and she came to me one day and, where were you? Over in Beaumont? I was in Orange. In Orange. And she knew that we were planning to build a library, and she was interested in coming over here, but she, would you believe that she said, do you think I could handle it? Do you think I could do it? <laughs> oh, we're so proud of what you have done. So glad you came. Well, Eva's told you about the building that Mr. Sterling gave us. And Doc's going to tell you about and, and Edna about this one, about how we struggled for all that. Um, I started the college after I finished high school in 1930. I had intended to go to the University of Texas to go to library school. But Jim Ferguson had thrown out the library school up there during the Depression. And I went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I had my eldest brother living, and went to school because they had a library school up there. But I had to come home at the end of two years because the money ran out. And after five more years, seven years, I finally worked my way through the University of Texas. But they didn't have a library school, so I got my BA degree and something else and came back and taught school for a while. And then I married and then my husband died in 46 and left me with a tiny child. And I bravely took my $5,000 worth of insurance that I had and went back to library school and got my graduate degree. And when I came home, my father said, I'm so glad you got that. He said, since you were 10 years old, all I have heard is libraries and books. <laughs> and I'm so thankful you finally made it. I, after a couple of years, I came back to, the, to Robert E. Lee and was there for five years. And then they put me over in the college in 55 to the college library. And I was there until I retired in 69. But I had some more experience in our high school library. We moved out to Robert E. Lee in 1928. And those of you who've been in Robert E. Lee know the upstairs front part of the building was the library. And we had a delightful library. Her name was Nelson also, no relation, Della Nelson, uh, from Wisconsin, I believe she was. She loved books and she loved boys and girls. And she organized a library club. And oh, did we ever have a good time. <laughs> she taught us how to arrange books, and we shelved books for her, and we mended. I don't know whether we destroyed them or not, but we mended some books. But we had a good time with her. And she had a party about once a month at her house for us. And she took us on swimming parties, and she arranged all kinds of things for us. And it just only whetted my interest in being a librarian. And she built up a pretty good size high school library. And then when the college was created in 34, I made some